Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can students look after their mental health at university? And I'm in conversation with Nick Hooper. My name is, uh, is Nick. Um, my grandma calls me Nicholas, but nobody really calls me Nicholas anymore. And I am a senior lecturer of psychology at the University of the West of England in Bristol. And uh, what is notable about me right now, and probably the reason why I'm having this conversation with you, Pookie, is that I've written a book about um, student mental health. And it's not really a book about student mental health, it's more a, a, a guide for students uh, about how to look after their well being when they're at university. And so that is a little bit about me. I mean, there's a lot more I could probably tell you, you know, about my journey into uh, into academia, my journey from secondary school through to A levels and uh, whatnot. But maybe we'll get into that uh, during the conversation. Absolutely. So let's start with the kind of episode question as the the jumping off point, which is yeah, very much focused on your book, which I love, by the way. Um, so how can students look after their mental health at university? What's the kind of big picture yeah. so what it is is I've been in my lab now for the last two years and I've and I've created this little pill and it's like a little magic pill and if you take it then your life will be absolutely wonderful and you'll have nothing to worry about forever and I'm joking like a lifetime supply please <laughs> yeah sure I, you know I, 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 I watched the film Limitless with Bradley Cooper and I just thought brilliant that's the answer all I've got to do is make that little pill and so uh no of course life's just not that simple is it and so a question like how do you how does a student maintain their well-being uh, at university? It's never going to be a straightforward answer or a straightforward road for students that are out there that are listening. But what I've done in the book is I've tried to uh, give some concrete, some concrete skills and some concrete bits of advice. And so the chapters of the book, they map on to uh, what's been referred to as the six ways to well-being. So these are six behaviours that psychologically healthy people tend to do. Um, and a lot of people that are listening will probably recognise them because they, they jump off the uh, New Economics Foundation Five Ways to Wellbeing, which you'll see in a lot of organisations and in universities as well, actually. Um, things like connecting with people or embracing the moment, challenging yourself, exercise, um, self-care, and one other that, of course, is going to elude me right now. And so the, these are sort of like the, the well-being behaviors that psychologically healthy people uh, tend to do. And so I wanted to give that advice and that information to university students, like do those things more. When you're in university, if you want to keep that ball rolling, because what's going to happen when you're in university is, is mirrors what's going to happen in life. You know, there's going to be some times that are lovely and great, and there's going to be some times that are a little bit more difficult. And, you know, what informs those changing times is a changing context, you know, living with new people, looking after yourself for the first time, being away from parents, being under pressure with regards to assignments, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, those things are going to fill your bucket. And sometimes when, uh, when things like that fill your bucket, you experience unwanted thoughts and unwanted feelings. Um, and I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is when those clouds come, and they'll come and they'll go and they'll come and they go and they'll go. But when those clouds come, can you can you behave in a way that's likely to be optimal for you in the long term by, for example, exercising or by connecting with people or by giving to people, uh, which is the one that I was missing, embracing the moment, challenging yourself, etc. And so that's like the gist of the book. But of course, I'm ranting now, Pookie, but I'm going to carry on while I'm uh, while I'm here. <laughs> you go. Um, it. Yeah, like it, it, it's, it can't be that simple. Because if it was that simple, everyone in the world would be psychologically healthy and they'd be doing those things. And so like the way that I pitched the book is that, of course, the reason why, like a lot of people in the world, they know that those things will probably be good for them, but don't do them. And so the question is why? And from my perspective, uh, the answer, of course, is the human mind and the way that it can be obstructive sometimes when we need to move towards things that are important to us. And so uh, in addition to saying, look, you need to do those six things a little bit more, uh, I've also talked about um, and explored the human mind, how it works, um, you know, why it does the things that it does uh, sometimes, and specifically with regards to avoidance. Um, 
and maybe some better ways of relating to our unwanted thoughts and our feelings that will still allow us to move freely in the uh, in the world. And so, yeah, it was really, I actually watched your your video with your daughter uh, earlier on where she talked, of course, about that, that pull of avoidance and the short term relief that you can get from it. Um, but of course, in the long term, avoiding things um, is, is probably going to narrow, narrow your life a little bit. And so, yeah, that's, that would be my, my, my longer answer as to how to maintain shoe well wellbeing, which is like, do those psychological, do those things that psychologically healthy people tend to do and, and figure out a way of relating to your thoughts and, and your feelings that pop, will pop up along your journey at university. I think one of the, the hard things there that you sort of alluded to is that I think when we're in a good place, actually, it's much easier to do those things. And you, you see that cycle, don't you? That real positive cycle of reinforcement and you're more able to do the things that keep you well and it's all good. And mm -hmm. I certainly found um, that like during this last lockdown, for example, my husband and I have both kind of got into a bit of a rut and we've kind of looked at each other and gone, well, we know all the things that we need to do to help ourselves. And even knowing it and knowing it will help when you're really low and you're really demotivated, it's, it's hard, isn't it, to engage with those things? Yeah, I, I've experienced that myself as well, even in the last, um, in the last few weeks. So we had a bit of news about my um, my father a few weeks ago and a cancer diagnosis. And of course, like when your your bucket is full with the stresses and strains of life, making those those uh, self care moves and also continuing to exercise or continuing to make effort to give to people or to connect with people or whatnot they fall into the background of your existence and, it, and your existence becomes about just essentially keeping going and that's fine I think like the the pitch of the book is when when the clouds come try to do as little damage as possible so that after they go, you're not in a bigger hole. I think that's a really, there's this, there's this real like temporal thing about suffering and human suffering that people always miss, which is that it does, it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. And so when it's here, can we try not to drink a load of alcohol? Can we try not to eat 10 tubs of Ben and Jerry's every day for a week? Can we try not to isolate ourselves from other people? Can we try to, you know, to, to maintain those things that keep a life ticking over so that after the clouds do pass, our life is still in some sort of fit state rather than, than being more broken than what it was when, when we had those clouds. And of course, then you're in that cycle then, right? Where you're in a bigger hole now and then there's more unwanted thoughts and feelings as a result of big, it being in a bigger hole and you're spiraling. And so it is, um, it is easier, of course, to do those things. And, and I guess you can relate this to students at university, right? Because some students will fly through university and it will be the happiest time of their life. And that's amazing. And that, what that means is, is that the context has, has, um, has occurred in such a way in a, in a student's life that it enables them to move stress-free through, throughout, throughout the university adventure. But for some students, the context, both from the past, you know, both their relationships with parents or students uh, um, and, and, and their, their context with the future, with their present, as in, do they like their housemates? Are they having troublesome relationships? Are they struggling with, with assignments and stuff? Those things are all going to inform how someone is, um, is getting on at university. So there's going to be those, that variability there. And so really when, that, um, when people do find themselves in those places where they're struggling, can they relate to their unwanted thoughts and feelings in a more functional way? Can they be willing to have them? Can they watch them and understand that having these unwanted thoughts and feelings doesn't make them abnormal. It makes them normal given the context and that a more functional way to manage those unwanted thoughts and feelings isn't to avoid the world. It isn't to stop going to lectures. It isn't to, um, you know, stop contacting family members or stop going out with friends or stop exercising or stop doing the things that make a life work. The, your job is to relate to those unwanted thoughts and feelings in such a way that you can still do the things that are important to you in the, uh, in the long term. And so that, that's essentially what the, the book is about. It's about trying to shift a student's perspective about the nature of suffering and about, and about how, to, how to move forward when it, when it comes along as it invariably 
will do if not in university then at, then at some point in their uh, in their life yeah. I hope that made sense I'm not sure you know I'm sort of uh, just it does make sense it does make sense and one of the things I find myself wondering I suppose is when I uh, first read your book um, I think it's incredibly useful to the particular demographic you're targeting at but I also think it is just far more widely applicable than that and I found myself wondering as you were talking um, about your dad who you do mention in the, in the book as well in, in, in a very diff different context but how the kind of skills and ideas that you're sharing in the book presumably they're exactly the things you would need to draw on when dealing with something like that that really challenging news and that diagnosis you've recently faced. Yeah yeah absolutely as in the, those things haven't that the, you get to the the last uh, chapter of the book and one of the last few paragraphs and I say something like I've essentially told you my philosophy for life I've essentially told you that this is how I live my life right now as a 36 year old man and so that the, you know if you if you think of what I'm the message I'm essentially sending to students is unwanted thoughts and feelings exist they're going to exist for you, whether you like it or not. Can we figure out a way of relating it to them in such a way that you still get to chase your dreams? And that hasn't changed for me. You know, that's still the case for me now. And it has been the case for me since I was their age, since I was, you know, 18 to 21 or even afterwards when I was doing my PhD and stuff. Now, I think that the cool thing about me writing this particular book is like, I'm almost evidence that this stuff matters because I, as a working class lad, have managed to change my stars. And of course, a lot of that is luck and timing and serendipity. But a lot of it is having the ability to keep going, even when your mind tells you you can't do it, or like you're not good enough to do it, or you're not smart enough to do it, or you don't belong here, or you're not worthy. And those sort of like thoughts and feelings that can easily stop people from doing uh, and going for things. Whereas I've, I've been able to do that, which is which is amazing, which means that I'm almost like a role model to, to students for, for like the importance of these skills. Now, when uh, I, I, a long time ago, a, a uh, writer, uh, he's a clinician as well. His name is uh, Russ Harris, and he's big within the acceptance and commitment therapy world of the ACT world. And he said that the way I write might lend itself to like a self-help book. And so I'd always thought, well, maybe I wouldn't write, mind writing something like this. And of course, because the the information that in, that's in the book actually, yes, it's useful for students, but it's also useful for everyone. Anyone could read that book and 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 and, and learn something from it, and and, and probably connect to it at a, in a in a more personal way as well. I always thought, well, maybe I'd be writing just a, a, an ordinary self help book, but I. Um, I'm still ranting. I'm, I probably shouldn't be talking as much as I am, Pookie, but I'll carry on. Um, that, that's your job, is it? The that's my job. I should be doing this. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But, so, so, but it was always in the back of my mind that maybe I would write something. And I love writing. Yeah. And then when my son was two, um, we were watching the film. He's five now. I should turn in six in a couple of months. We were watching the film, The Lion King. And um, I'm sure everybody listening has watched The Lion King. But the um, the daddy lion dies. If you haven't watched The Lion King, I've ruined it for you. I'm very very sorry about ruining The Lion King for you. But the daddy lion and in dies. Titanic, the ship sinks, right? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> sorry, um, go on. The Lion King. Yeah. And so so I, you know I, when he was two, I was crying, and he's just like looking at me, like what happened to the to the daddy uh, lion, daddy? And I'm like, I I, I can't explain death to you right now, boy. So I'm just like nothing. He just going to sleep but of course like in my mind I'm upset at this and the reason I'm upset is I'm just thinking dear me like what if I die and this little two-year-old exists without me around and and you'll know yourself the impact that becoming a parent can have on uh, on your existence and uh, my existence at least became about him uh, from the moment that he was born and so I started writing a book to him a self-help book aimed at one person and I started that the, the next day after that after that and so I the, the first version of this book was actually written to my own son to be given to him when he was 18 because of course I couldn't be given a book about psychological well-being and, and like clinical psychology skills to a 12 year old or an eight year old or a five year old and so I said to my wife look it's saved in this part of my computer if by the time Max is 18 I don't happen to be around anymore you need to give this book to uh, to him 
and then of course I, I I read the book once it was finished and it it was it was as much written to my students as it was written to, to Max. You know, it was written to my boy to be given to him as an 18 year old. When in the daytimes I was interacting with 18 year olds who were struggling in, in various ways and they were in my mind and I was thinking of examples and things. And so it was at that point that it became obvious that the the peop the, the 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 audience that I'm most uh, suitable to talk to are students. Yeah. They're who I've been around for the last 18 years or something. And so although the the stuff that's covered in the book is pretty uh, general and anyone could read it and get something from it, those they're my gang. They're my posse, you know, <laughs> students, students are my people. And so it felt appropriate to be writing something to them for for them to use as they uh, as they go into that that university transition and try and manage all of the the strains that can come with that and I, I, I wouldn't want students if students listen to this or educators for a lot of people university is great of course it is and so maybe some students out there will be thinking well I'm not sure I get a, a lot from a book like this because I'm fine um, but you you don't know how long you'll be fine for for yeah. one uh, but two, even if you're like you're doing pretty well, this book can still help. This book can still give you the skills to chase to chase your dreams, even if you're not like, you know, diagnosing yourself with any sort of mental health problem. And so um, and so, yeah, sorry to go back to your original question about it being general. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, yeah, I read it now. And it it like prompts me into some sort of some sort of action now as a 36 year old man. But um, I'm glad that it's written to the demographic that. I most um that I've the most experience with and that I care and some I care the most about um, I think it's also helpful for um students might read it I quite often find when I'm teaching young people it can help to teach the lens of supporting a friend and I think definitely um it would be a helpful read for every student so they can be a good friend to their friends but also for um parents and carers and other interested adults trying to think how to help a young person who is is going through the university things I think you provide such sort of practical tangible stuff that people can do um, and I think it can feel sometimes like you're quite far away or you don't know how to help and actually here you, you've got real simple prompts haven't you? you can work through the six rules and kind of say well you know how, what are you doing in terms of exercise or when's the last time that you connected with people or or, or, or what have you so I think yeah. it's, it's really helpful from that point of view yeah and do you think that the kind of do you think obviously when you wrote the book mm. albeit you wrote it actually with different purpose in mind with your son but when you wrote the book we were living in quite a different world weren't we and the world that this book gets birthed into it comes out in July, is that July. Right? Yeah, yeah. July. July so the 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 world that this book gets birthed into is not the one in which it was conceived like un university students have maybe not been face to face for some time now and not quite sure what next year looks like for them do they face different challenges does this book still hold water do you think or hold water even more so I don't know yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? So, I mean, I, I wrote this, I had it written, obviously, for Max, and then I rewrote it during lockdown. And another time you, with COVID, you're thinking, it's going to end soon. Surely it's going to end soon. And it just <laughs> yeah. kept going. And so my, my agent said to me, you know, we're, we're, we're going into a very different world. And so you need to talk about COVID because originally I said to him, I don't want to, I don't want to touch COVID in my book. This book was written for students pre-COVID not for students yeah. post COVID. And so he said, yeah, but COVID has changed the world as, as we live in. And so like you have to, it has to be mentioned at least. And so I, I have mentioned it and, and I'm, I'm fine with that because I think even if someone in 15 years reads the book, it's quite interesting for them to have an insight into my context at the time. The context of the, uh, the context of our lives for the last year has been, has been COVID. So that's, that's cool. I'm happy with that. But with regards to your question about is it still, you know, is it still appropriate? I think that, that um, the thing about unwanted thoughts and feelings is they've, they've always been there. They've always been there. You know, I, 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 in the first chapter, I talk a little bit about the history of psychology and the treatment of people with mental health problems. And, you know, going back to Benjamin Rush in like the 1700s, who, and I love that bit of trivia in that in the book about how he signed the, the Declaration of Independence in the US. I love little bits of trivia like that. But, you know, 
people back then had unwanted thoughts and feelings and he tried to treat them with a bunch of horrible things ranging from emetics to the spinning chair to purges and and whatnot and he had you know interesting ideas about what caused mental health problems which is like abnormalities in the blood vessels or something like that and then if you track the treatment of people with mental health problems from that early on you'll see that they never went anywhere no matter what was going on in the world they were always they were always existing and what's changed is like how we approach mental health problems um and so like yes the book was written pre-covid with the idea that students can uh have unwanted thoughts and feelings during university and this book is gonna help them to manage those unwanted thoughts and feelings a little bit better while still doing those important well-being behaviors and moving towards their values, being the sort of person they really want to be in the, uh, in the world. Now, the thing about COVID is after it, there's still going to be unwanted thoughts and feelings. The nature of them might have changed. The nature of the pressures might have changed. Like instead of now the social um, awkwardness of walking into a seminar class where there are 25 people that you don't know and having to find a table and strike up conversation, those social anxieties. Now we're going to have the social anxieties of turning on, unmuting yourself mm. and talking in an online way and having that awkward, can you hear me? You know, is everyone listening? <laughs> those like those really awkward things that happen in online learning or worse than that, you don't unmute yourself and you're not really engaging yeah. now and you're not getting the most out of your degree or worse than that, you know, you're, you're living a, a world in isolation, which is probably the biggest threat that COVID has uh, presented, at least in my opinion, for human beings is just this, this, this isolation that impacts your ability to connect with other human beings. And which is just such a, such an important aspect of being alive, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. hu human connection. And so I, I, I think that you know, I could guess as to what life is going to be like post COVID for university students. It'll, I'm sure it'll be a blended learning approach. I'm sure they'll still be doing online learning. I think they'll probably get back together for seminars. And of course, this book will help them when it comes to, uh, to such things. And I don't think unwanted thoughts and feelings generally are going anywhere. And so mm -hmm. this book will help them to be able to manage those things and keep their feet moving towards important well-being behaviors when when they've got clouds um i think that answers your question it does it does answer my question i think it's it's hard uh to know how best to advise uh young people in the current moment and i think maybe actually thinking about what's the evergreen advice um might be a really sensible way of, of kind of looking at it because i think that so many of us have been a bit wrong-footed i think m many of us I've certainly been in the situation where young people I've spoken to who were looking for advice last year about should they go up to uni or wait a year and you find yourself going, oh you know wait a year and, yeah. and it'll all be gone and um yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I think we all feel yeah the thing we all have in common right now is none of us quite know what to expect and I think we've all given up trying to guess now haven't we and uh yeah I, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's a nice thing though I mean I, I, and I think that young people appreciate that I think my students appreciate it when I say I don't know I, I wish I wish I knew the answer. I wish I had a magic ball. I wish I could say to you, this is how it's going to go. And these are the decisions that I'd be making if I was you. But like life doesn't happen like that. What happens is you make a decision and you hope it works. Yeah. And that's it. And sometimes stuff works out and sometimes stuff doesn't work out. And when stuff doesn't work out, that is not a reason to not do more stuff. No, you know, like not, like bumps and scrapes in the journey that they're fine. And so just uh, like those, a generalized skill of relating to bumps and failures in a more functional way is probably the thing that I'm after more than offering them any sort of certainty about about the way life is going to mm. be uh, going going forward because I don't I don't know myself and I think that you know from from reading the book at least I hope you got this sense I I wrote it as I in the most authentic way that I could yeah I wrote it as I speak to my students do you and swear so, when you speak to your students? I always swear. Yeah, it's the Welsh, <laughs> the Welsh in me. I'm always swearing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, to me, sometimes for pedagogical reasons, you know, as in, you know, if you need to catch their attention. Yeah. That's a good way of like catching, catching their attention, but often just because it's like part of my, my, uh, my lingo sometimes. But there's, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say now, which was, um, what was the question? 
sorry, I took you offline with, uh, yeah, asking you about swearing. Yeah, I know, you did. Um, oh, what was it? <laughs> Brilliant, isn't it? Oh, never mind. We can we can move on. Maybe it's on. okay. Yeah. I I I was wondering as well about um whether you as someone who so you said you kind of came from a working class background and you've you know had uh, sort of various opportunities that uh, either you've taken or that you've created um, throughout your life and I wondered if as that if that makes a difference to the kind of advice that you give. Um, Cause certainly I was a young person that came from a working class background and went off to university and I hated it, <laughs> but I, I didn't have your book to help me. And I think, you know, when I first read your book that was one thing that, that I fed back genuinely, completely honestly was, I really wish I would have had this book to read uh, before I would have gone to university. It would have made a big difference if I would have actually listened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I think that yeah it's tricky isn't it i mean i wouldn't want to what i'm i think having coming from the working class background maybe gave me um some sort of drive um you know maybe a work ethic maybe an um an insight into some of the struggles that uh, working class people have you know like being in a family where the conversation conversations about money were every day yeah um and so of course those things those things uh, shaped me and and a lot of uh people that are um that are reading the book won't come from that sort of background and they'll still have legitimate struggles uh, it doesn't really matter how much how much money you've got you know we all exist in very different contexts and can and, and still what what unites us more than anything probably is uh, is suffering and so i think it doesn't really matter like where you come from uh, i think this book will still be useful to you but i think what happened for me and the reason why i um i i managed to keep going and keep having ideas and keep chasing them and keep pushing um, was uh, two things. One, uh, and this is me speaking really frankly, by the way, I have not really thought about this before. Um, one was I, I met ACT when I was doing the third year of my degree. So in my degree, I hated it. I, I, I wasn't a fan of psychology at all. I, I chose psychology because during my A-levels, I liked it more than French and politics, but not because I loved it and I really sort of like wanted to do it. I, I did it because I knew I needed a degree to be able to get a decent job. And psychology was the one that was more palatable than the, uh, than the other two. And then in the first couple of years of my degree, <clears throat> I didn't engage with it at all. And I was living in Cardiff and traveling back and forth to Swansea. And of course, you don't want to travel an hour for an hour lecture where someone reads off the slides to drive back an hour. And so I just thought, oh, you know, I'll read, I'll read the stuff myself. Of course, I didn't read the stuff myself. I ended up sort of like messing around with my friends or working in restaurants and hotels and stuff. And then in the third year of my degree, um, inspired, by my, inspired by my dad and the way that he was dealing with his suffering, which was avoidance, I thought, well, uh, I don't think people talk about their problems enough. I think they try and suppress them. And I got randomly, uh, you know, in a, in a fateful way, uh, directed to a new member of staff at Swansea University and she gave me this book about ACT and as a result of reading that book about ACT and especially the idea of self stories acceptance and commitment therapy for yeah, sorry acceptance yeah. and commitment therapy yeah um, which back then nobody had heard of mm. you know it was really really new and even now many people I'm sure wouldn't have heard of it but anyhow I connect, I connected with it and um the, especially the idea of self stories the idea that we build stories about ourselves over time and that often those stories can imprison you you know they can hold you back if you've got a story about like you know I'm not a good public speaker then what does that stop you from doing or if you've got a story about you know not being smart enough then what does that story stop you from doing and so as a result of that I was able to um like hold my stories more lightly and not let them influence my decision making. And so in the book, I talk about this. I essentially became a yes man. Anytime something made me feel uncomfortable, I said, I said, yes, equipped with this idea that, 
the stories that I held about myself were just that, were just stories and equipped with the idea that I could have discomfort. Discomfort wasn't something that I immediately needed to get rid of. And in fact, it's, it's, it, discomfort is usually a signal that something's important. And so anytime something made me feel discomfort, I said yes to it. And when my, PhD, my, my uh, supervisor said, do you want to do a PhD? I said yes before I even knew what a PhD was. I <laughs> just, <laughs> yep, this, 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 like, this is going to push me. I'm going to go for it. And more or less every step of my career, whenever an opportunity has come along, including this, you know, including speaking to someone, uh, someone like yourself, you know, immediately your, your mind goes, no, 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 <laughs> this is, don't do this. You know, this is going to be really anxiety provoking. You're probably going to say something rubbish or forget, you know, your line of thought in the middle of, uh, in the middle of an that, interview. That won't happen, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and still say yes and still, and still get on and, um, and do it. And are you, you said something similar to your, to your daughter in that um in that clip which is the you know if, if you want to feel anxious about something then continue to not do it that's the way to 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 keep your anxiety you know if you mm. can get out there and sometimes your anxiety doesn't change even with lectures and stuff i still feel anxious before i go out there but i'm able to relate to it in such a way that i don't um close down and i'm still able to do those things and so that would be the one thing that changed for me that allowed me to to, to to push mm -hmm. and to chase my dreams and stuff. And so that uh, I've tried to get a lot of those act skills and funnel them into the book in various ways, just like more functional ways of like relating to uh, one's thoughts and feelings. But I also, I also, and I've never said this before. So, so this is a, this is a, the first that I'm saying it to you is I also, and this is back to the working class thing. I'd go to conferences as a PhD student. And of course you'd meet these really impressive people. And a lot of like my friends and whatnot, they found such people intimidating. And I never did. Mm. I never found well-to-do, well-respected people who had achieved a lot of stuff. I was never intimidated by them. And the reason why I wasn't intimidated by them was, um, I've got quite teary actually saying this, was because I never, because I always looked to them and thought, you've done amazing things and you're not a more worthy human being than my dad or my mum or my neighbours or, um, or those people that came from that place. And so like from very early on, informed by ACT and some of the theory around it, like this idea that people are a product of their experiences. And so if someone is doing particularly well, a certain context, allowed that to happen it allowed them to become that person and if you come from a working class background often you don't get that context that would allow you to flourish and that doesn't make you any less of a human being or a worthy human being and so maybe that maybe that helped I was never intimidating to go into a room of people that had done really well and tell them what I thought um and so yeah that that yeah I'm not sure if that I think that answers your question yeah and I I wonder as well you 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 talk about your um your your dad in the book and it seems that he's been a really important role model to you not least because he's had to overcome adversity and challenge and do you find yourself kind of drawing on him as a kind of parenting role model as well as thinking about how you support young people through your book and through your work Yeah yeah I mean it's a you know it's a funny one with uh with my dad because in some ways he's the blueprint for what not to do you know as in as in uh his way of managing the uh the suffering that he was going through wasn't a functional thing to do and it had a lot of knock-on effects and a lot of consequences to it right up till you know this uh the, literally the last few weeks um and so and at the same time, he always managed to put us first, and he always managed to be there for us and to and to um, to take his parental responsibilities seriously. And maybe the most important parental responsibility of love. Um, and so, in some ways, you know, he's a blueprint for how to be in the world. But more than that, he's probably a lesson for me about suffering, um, 
how it happens, how life can be hard sometimes, uh, how people sometimes deal with it in ways that aren't brilliant, and uh, how there are better ways. There are better ways of sorry, I'm covering my mouth. How there are better ways of uh, of dealing with it. And so, you know, when the reason why I did a PhD in the first place was because of my dad. Now, not because he said to me, "You need to go and do extra studying." Mm-hmm. It was because I could see what he was going through, and I was thinking that is not the best way to be dealing with this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, he, I speak about him because, you know, it's um, I speak about him in the context of of love and pain and the the two sides of that coin, and how that played out in my with my relationship with him, and specifically, it reached a point where I was seeing him in pain, and I didn't like that the pain that that brought me and so the easiest thing for me to do to manage that pain was just not speak to him and of course all I'm doing there is trying to protect myself from pain but in trying to protect myself from pain I'm also stopping myself from connecting with someone that's really important to me and I think that's like the pitch of that particular chapter which is about look if you're going to get into relationships with people you do so with the knowledge that things might not work out they might leave you know, they might be hurt. And if they're hurt, you're hurt. They might die. In fact, they'll definitely die at some point. And either they're going to die before you or you're going to die before them. And so you're going to have to deal with that pain. Now, your other option is you throw that coin away. You just don't love people. But then what sort of life are you going to are you going to be living? Like you have to go into love knowing that pain is, you know, it's just a stone's throw away. And so that's the, the reason why I talked about my dad in that, in that particular chapter, because it just felt like an example that, would hopefully make sense to people and inspire them to choose to love yeah. with the knowledge that pain is, is, is going to be there as well, whether they like it or, uh, or not. And also because I, you know, I wanted the writing in the book to be, to be personal. I wanted it. I, I, I always had this, this, this worry. And my worry was this, it's going to sound bizarre, but university students don't like reading. And so I'm like, I'm writing a book to a population of people that don't generally like to read. And so I was like, how am I going to get over this? And of course, like I had to try and write a well-being book that was going to be entertaining. Like it's a book about psychological well-being. And so it's not naturally a topic that lends itself well to comedy. And so I've tried my best to, to sort of like bring that comedic value to it and that entertaining value as well. But I also thought like if I can give myself a little bit in the writing, maybe that will that'll wrap people into what I'm going for. And it will also like break up the heavier psychology, the heavier, the heavier content to have stories in there as well. And so it, it, um, yeah, I hope that that, that that does function in the way that it was intended when I was, when I was writing the book. Yeah. And dogs, I can't, how you make, you, you, you dedicate the, the book amongst other people to your dog. Yeah. Um, you talk about dogs and how happy talk, talk to me about dogs yeah oh I love dogs so we so we um I've grown up with dogs anyway but um I, I lived in Cyprus for a couple of years and when we lived in uh, Cyprus they didn't have a neutering program in the north of Cyprus at the time and um and so there were dogs everywhere and a couple of dogs followed us home after walks and the one of the one of those dogs is uh, called Dora, and Dora is mentioned throughout the book. It's amazing, dogs, isn't it? How they like they infiltrate your existence, and they really become part of, you know, that they're like a, a constant in in your life. I think they mean a lot psychologically to people more than what they might expect, because I, I I'm talking about something slightly different now, but I think they signal the passage of time. You know, like if you have got a dog and you've had a dog for 10 years Mm. and then that dog passes away, you immediately have the thought, 10 years has gone, Mm. gone. Time has passed. And in the background of every picture, there they were in this dog, not really demanding a whole lot from you, but always loyal, always fun and always, you know, having having that feeling of like protecting, uh, that protecting you. And I think that my experience with dogs is that I've always gone into them thinking that, I'm saving them. And then when I look back across time, it turns out they were saving me. And so like, I do have like a really 
special relationship. And so you'll see Dora dotted throughout. And I, to, to, to the point at which that I make a joke at some point in the book, which is if if you don't like dogs, I'm really sorry <laughs> that I've talked about <laughs> dogs so much in this uh, in this book. But there are just so many stories and little anecdotes that lend themselves well to the points that I was trying to make. And so, of course, what you know what it's like when you're, you're sat down in your living room and you're writing a book. Who's there sat? by the fire on their pillow they're always they're always there right and so like it, it's difficult to for, for them not to pop into your mind when you're sat on your laptop uh typing and so yeah she's she's an old, older girl now Dora she's like got anemia at the moment and so she's on like steroids and she's like I, di I didn't really fully know this before but steroids apparently make people really people and dogs really hungry and thirsty and so she's wild for food as in pulling tubs of lure pack off the top of the kitchen uh yeah, like she this this morning, she took a banana skin off the kitchen top and ate a banana skin. Wow, I know. So like she's really wild, and she's she's wild for food anyway because she was emaciated when we met her as a as a stray dog in Cyprus. So she's always had this food thing, but now more than ever, she's just like I will eat anything. She will eat anything, and so um, and so yeah. But she's she's doing well. She's all right. You've got one yourself, right? Three. Yeah, you could hear them in the background. Yeah. Well, so I live with um, we live three generations in one home, but we yeah. used to live next door to each other. So now we all live together. We've uh, got uh, yeah all the combined dogs. So, okay. yeah, one cat and three dogs. Three dogs is a lot of dogs, I'd have to say. And whilst we're looking at moving um, yeah, finding somewhere that's got enough garden for three dogs is. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. It's high, aren't they, as well? As yeah. in, like, I, there are so many times when we, we think, oh, well, should we go away for the weekend? And we're just like. What are we going to do with Dora? And then yeah. all of a sudden, <laughs> a year of a weekend away is gone. <laughs> and so yeah. they are they are definitely a, a responsibility. But um, I they make I people talk to you as well. So I mm. used to, when I first had Buddy, who is my dog, so the other two are my mother in laws really, but Buddy is my dog and he's a trained uh, kind of therapy dog and he used to go everywhere with me. He was a registered assistance dog because I used to struggle with dissociations. I have um, PTSD and I would find myself in kind of unsafe situations. But as long as my dog was with me, I was generally okay. Um, but the thing was that after a while, I found it to be, as I got just generally a bit better, I found it more harmful than helpful helpful to have him with me because everyone always wants to talk to you when you have a dog and I'm yeah. autistic and that you know you get to the point of kind of complete overwhelm by about 10 o'clock in the morning if you're traveling yeah. around London with a dog so I started yeah. uh yeah traveling without him but no he's he's brilliant and he still knows you know he now he's just a pet but um he knows if I'm having a bad day he he won't leave me <laughs> it's amazing isn't it how they, how they manage to do that I, I always say with dogs that they're like the way that I walk with Dora there are there are like certain rules for dog walking that nobody ever talks about and uh and i'm the i'm the type of dog walker that i generally go out to walk to be by myself mm -hmm. not to have conversations with people and but you do naturally get into that dog walking community and so i'm that person that just keeps their head down mm -hmm. like no eye contact whatsoever keep moving oh i'll I, you know i'll say oh hey how you doing and then i'm gone straight away afterwards because that's just not what uh i'm hoping for as a result of, of uh, dog walking i'm hoping for a bit of time you know just to see speak. i think i think dogs generally are just one of the best um things in terms of keeping you mentally well so when we we got buddy it was very soon after we lost tragically lost the dog uh, got run over and um I wasn't in a great place and I knew that one of the things that was keeping me well was the fact I had to get up every morning and get out and walk my dog and I've had periods in my in my life where I've not left the house for weeks and weeks and weeks on end when I've been really poorly um, mm. but having a dog meant I had to do the hardest thing first thing every morning and once you've done that everything else is a little bit more manageable isn't it mm. um, and that routine that they and I think there's lots about having a dog that makes you do your your kind of six things really doesn't it your your connecting yeah. got the routine yeah. some exercise and yeah, yeah my wife and I talk about it all the time about how you know, you know there are people that we know that don't leave their house enough and that we haven't got a choice yeah. <laughs> whether it's raining or whether it's snowing or whether it's hailing we're out twice a day walking that dog and in doing so we happen to be exercising and we happen to be connecting with people and it would maybe when you're in the elements you're more likely to be embracing the moment and so yeah. there are different things that are going on for you like especially if we go and see the sea oh you know you, you know, anytime I see the sea I come back and I feel more invigorated as a result of it and the only reason I went to see it was because I knew the dog needed walking and so I think that um yeah they, they bring they, they do bring a lot of uh, a lot of joy
Yeah, I think they, they give us more than we give them a lot of the time, don't they? If you had to pick one of your, your six, what do you think is the most important? If people feel like they can only do one of those things in your book, one of those things you advise, what do you yeah. think is the most important? Um, I cheated, really, because I, I actually talked about human relationships in two chapters. And I, it was funny. It was funny writing the book because I knew that I was cheating, but I also had the thought, it's my book. I can do what I want with it. What you like. So, yeah. So in that, there are two chapters, right? There's one called connecting with people and there's one yeah. called giving to people. Now the connecting with people is, is more like a, um, uh, an exploration of human relationships from a, a more shallow level or, or a less deep level. But the, in the chapter given to others, after talking about the benefits of, for example, giving to charity or giving your time to, to people, I talk about this idea of giving yourself to someone, which is essentially that deeper form of human relationship that you have with very important people in your life and the pain that that, that, that can bring sometimes and why we should still be doing those things. And so I think that that would be I think that's my major reason for being alive, my major reason for continuing to want to be alive are the people that I love. And uh, right now, my son, more than uh, more than anyone else. But I, I like people. I, you know, I, I like students. I like speaking to students. I like getting to know them. I like thinking about where they, where, what their background is and what they're going to be able to go on to achieve and how I might play some small role in helping that to, uh, to happen. And so that would be the one probably more than more than any of the uh, any of the others and that's maybe the hardest one to do at the moment isn't it I think so yeah I, th I think it's I think it's I think people easily get into the habit of protecting themselves from other people and the pain that other people can bring and in doing so stop themselves from doing the most important thing that they could be doing which is which is connecting with uh with people i i talk about it in the book so I, I talk about in that chapter my relationship with my my son a little bit and just how like when you have a, a child it's like you now live in a world where if anything happens to them you don't know what that looks like for you it's like wearing your heart you've got two hearts now you've got your own heart that could stop beating at any point but you've also got this heart mm -hmm. over there that if anything happens to that heart over there, this heart over here, yeah. I don't know what, what, you know, how you come back from that. And like, and I, and I know that. And so the question is then how, how do I, what am I going to try and do to protect myself from the pain that my son, how might that play out? And you see it in little ways, you know, if he's hurt, am I empathetic and loving towards him or am I angry with him? Am I angry at him because he's hurt? My, he's hurt himself, and now I've got to see him hurt, and I'm ang and I'm now in pain as a result of that. So, you know, how how is that going to play out? And so, it's just about trying to uh, have that have that play out in a in a better in a better way than what it might. And when you look under the bonnet of what's going on, what's actually going on is um, that I really love my son, and sometimes when he's hurt, I don't know I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what to do with that. And I think you you'll see that a lot a lot under the bonnet when you get into people's relationships and when you talk when I talk to my students about their parents I always ask my students why do you think they've done that yeah. you know if, if, if a student's got a parent that's being particularly tough on them why why are they why are they being tough on you what, from their perspective what do they think they're doing and of course all they're all they're doing is trying to prepare the students for the for the I said, well now it might not be the best thing to do they might be going the wrong way about it, but what's actually underneath the bonnet there is just love. It's just, I want to help in, in some way. And this is uh, what I think might, might help. And so, and I think that that allows students to have more patience and compassion and love for the people around them because they know what the intention is for those people. The people might not get it right, but they know what the, atten the intention is. Yeah. Um, and so, Sometimes yeah. what we need to do and what feels like the right thing can be different though, can't they? I mean, you mentioned earlier, having watched uh, the video of myself with Lyra. So Lyra struggles with uh, school-based anxiety and actually she'd gone through a pretty good period recently, but having gone back from the most recent longer lockdown period, things have got really hard for her again. And I know because, you know, you Google this stuff, I'm the person you'll find, I know about this stuff, yeah. but as a parent, it's completely different. And 
taking my daughter to school in the morning and when she is in that state yeah. of anxiety and all she wants me to do is scoop her up and take her home yeah. with me that would be a completely natural and normal thing to do and it feels like the kind thing to do but I know it's the wrong thing to do and it's yeah. so so hard to override that you know and again like you say the amount that that drains you as a parent I feel for her way more deeply than I ever ever feel for myself and oh, yeah. yeah, by the time that I've said goodbye to her and I've done the, you know, calm and smiley and I get in my car and I'm, I'm a wreck. Yeah. No, <laughs> I've, I've, I've had no idea when too. I took on parenting, but. Yeah, I mean, the, like, you know, when you're on that school run and I, when Max was sort of like three, four, he really didn't want to go. And so you, you, a nursery and stuff, and they're, they're ripping them from you. And like you say, like those words really resonate that you just want to scoop them up and take them home and say, I got you. My job on this on this earth is to protect you and keep you safe. I'm going to do that right now, and you know that it's going to do them no favors in the in the long term. And so it is like, the, and I I'll get back from the school run, and me and my wife will just sit there. Like, How do we get on with the day now, knowing that our world is now over there, and you've just had to go through that for the last hour, and you do feel physically uh, physically drained. And so, yeah, that that I I totally get what you're saying but by how, that point of course he's probably all playing with the legos and he's fine but <laughs> yeah, i know and you always i, I always uh, it, it was just frustrating me because i'd pick him up from school and, and i'd say how how school he said i really liked it it's really fun and then the next day when you take him to school he'd be i don't want to go to school i don't want to go to school i hate school and you say but yesterday you said you really liked it and he was like I still don't want to go to school. I don't like, you know, I, I hate school and something like he forgets really easy. I'm just like, learn from your experience, kid. If you have a good day, like let that register in your brain so that you're not stressing me out in the mornings when you go into uh, school <laughs> telling me that you, uh, you hate it there. And so, yeah, it is, uh, it's hard. It's hard. And this is, it's something that uh, just plays out at all forever. Just this, yeah. this thing of like, why do people do the things that they're, that they're doing? And as soon as, as soon as you start thinking that way, honestly, life gets a lot easier because you start to really see the function of people's behavior and you start to think, okay, all right, they didn't get it right. But I can see why they were doing it. And I, and I really appreciate it. And I, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, but for like human beings, you know, life is so tricky, isn't it? Human beings are so tricky. Yeah. Um, it, there's, there's so much for people to, to deal with. And so it is, um, it's hard. And that's the same at, the same at, at university for some students so you know my, my, my I think that I said to my um my agent which is a weird thing for me to have to say but uh, this sounds strange even as I say the words I said this is the only book I'm writing so I'm not writing another book like this was the book that I was meant to write I know that this was the book I was meant to write and he's like yeah all writers say that and I said no no really I think this is it I don't think I've got anything left to say I think this is this is the uh the one and so there's nothing tokenistic in the book there's nothing put in there that i didn't need to be in there and the, and and i wrote it to be to be real to, to be real and to be gen genuinely useful and not to sell books and not for money and not for fame or any of those things just because this is my contribution do you know what i mean this is my this is these are the things i've learned these yeah. are the things i want young people to know and if it helps 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, one person, I've, I've done, I, I go to bed now feeling like I've, feeling proud of, I've done something. I put something together that I really think is going to be uh, useful for university students. And I, I, I send it to my students at UWE. And of course, they're tainted by the fact that like that I often supervise them. So it sort of is in their benefit to like my book. But like some of them have had some really... <laughs> A, you know deep and meaningful experiences as a result of reading the book and so like i it's not just that i think it could help i sort of i, I know that i know that it can because i've now had 30 to 50 students that have read it and said I, I, things have just changed for me slightly as a result of reading the book and so it's, it's a really sort of fulfilling feeling to think that i've done this and yeah i, I said to my wife i'm done i'm done now now i'm gonna go and i'm gonna work maybe in a forest school or as a postman or just do something <laughs> outdoors. I'm done with academia. I'm done with writing. I'm done with pushing the boundaries. I'm now ready. I've done my thing. I've done everything that I wanted to do. And now I think I'm ready to go and buy a caravan in West Wales and sort of 
I'd love that. Your, your, your students are lucky to have you. It's, just, it's funny, just as you're saying that, I was just trying to reflect on my own time at university and just one conversation. And actually, my tutor was generally very good. But I just remember one time me walking in for a tutor on her just saying, don't get any thinner or we'll have to send you home. And I know and you know that you wouldn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you take maybe a slightly different tack than that, don't you? I was anorexic at the time, just for the record. That, yeah, that's yeah. why the weird comment. Um, yeah. That wasn't wasn't necessarily something she uh, she knew about um yeah. but yeah i think your your approach may be a li li little better time, time maybe, to maybe. i mean it's a bit uh I'd, to be fair I, try, I, I you know i do try i try to and you'll get pick this up from the book i, I try to be straight mm. so like you you know your tutor there was probably too straight but <laughs> i do try to be straight as in like look life's hard yeah i, I wish it wasn't I wish it wasn't. I wish I wish you're suffering, whatever it is you're going through. I wish it wasn't happening for you. I wish I could take it away. I can't. And you know what? There's no one in the world that can. There's no magic. There's no magic bullet that exists out there for mental health problems. And they're not even mental health problems. They're problems that arise as a result of being a human being. And so it is a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a humbling experience to, 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 to do that and to, to try and be straight with people in a way that's in a way that's loving and also soft and so it is it's, i get it wrong so much mm. you know it's so I like people will sometimes say wow you're really blunt i'm just like yeah i got it wrong then because like i don't ever want to come across as sounding blunt because i want it to be seen as coming from a loving place but sometimes you know you've you've got to be hard and you've got to be straight with uh with people and maybe that can that can help them accept okay yeah. okay life is hard okay unwanted thoughts and feelings I've got to make friends with them i've got to, i've got to have them on my journey of life and now that i know those things now what now what's life going to be about for me what what am i gonna what am i gonna chase what am i gonna dream of how am i gonna make the world a better place um and so yeah it's uh, uh yeah I, I don't think that your tutor got that right and I, I'm sure I have. I'm sure there are students out there right now thinking, hang on, this one time he said this to me. And so, yeah, I'm sure I'm a little bit too blunt with them sometimes as uh, as well. But um, she did great things for hopefully me. Hopefully in a functional way, hopefully, hopefully in a useful in a useful way, you know. Yeah. Um, what what final thought would you like to leave people with as we wrap up? Oh, do you know, a final thought to leave um, to leave people with. Um, it's tricky as well because you don't know who's listening. So if there were, if I knew, you know, a lot of students were listening right now, there would be a different final thought to a lot of uh, maybe teaching personnel or or whatnot. And so I'll address it to sort of like the the lay person rather than to the students because my gut would be that that would be the audience that's likely to be to be listening to this. Um, so my final message would be. Um, the trick in life is to keep going and that's it that's that that's that uh, uh, after 36 years of living in this world all i've got is life can be tough and there are going to be storms and there are going to be clouds and there's going to be sunshine as well and that uh, in fact the only thing that we can do is to try to keep going when life gets tough so that by the time life gets less tough we are the wheels of our life are still in motion and if you want tips for how to keep going and like also where to keep going the sort of behaviors that you might want to think about doing then you know my book will give you some ideas for that it's not a panacea it's not going to solve the world's problems or anything but it might it might be useful for you for when things get tough and, uh, and, and, you know, you don't want your life to, uh, to shut down. And so, yeah, that's it. That's all I've got is, you know, just try and try and keep going, try and keep those feet moving, even when uh, life's hard. Mm -hmm.